This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbara, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I'm joined by my co host, Joshua Ryan Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing today? Gino, man, I'm excited. It's warming up a little bit here in Florida, enough to wear short sleeves and shorts. So that, that's what's exciting for me, man. Gino, what's going on in your world? Uh, there's so many things going on, Josh, right now. You know, the studio situation, the lighting and everything going crazy. Uh, other than that, we're closing deals. We're doing a lot of small deals. You know, we just closed in a 25 unit. We're closing on a 21 unit in a couple of weeks. We've got a 40 unit and an 18 unit on the contract right now. So it's busy on the front. And we're also looking at developing. We bought a couple of pieces of land as well. So there are deals out there, everybody. And that's what's encouraging by this market. So we'll see where it goes. Love it. What I'm excited for is today's guest. Today, we have Ryan Johnson. He's a practicing nurse anesthetist, but has been investing in real estate since 2017. His experience includes land acquisitions, fix and flips, and small multifamily development. In 2020, he shifted his focus to acquiring and operating commercial multifamily assets. He has invested in 138 units as a general partner and 228 units as a limited partner. He also has six units in the development pipeline for his personal portfolio. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Ryan. Gino, Josh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Kind of hindsight is 2020. It's like I, I joined the community a year ago in February of 2021, and it's February 2022, and I'm on a podcast with you guys. So that, that's you, pretty cool. You know what's awesome? I remember, remember when you joined, I got on my first call, and you are a very visual person, and a lot of the students want to know, how am I going to get there? What's my next thing? I'm looking at deals, and you had a lot of different things going on, and you're a very high-level individual. And I remember there's so many different ways to get into it, and I remember you doing these like little deals, the six units and all, what attracted you to going bigger and, and just taking and pivoting that course and I guess, trusting the process? You know, ultimately, like I, I real, realized the scalability and like larger assets, that that was definitely attractive. And, you know, I, I realized that I, I didn't want to just own, you know, I could have continued to buy smaller deals or build smaller deals. And I do still do development in smaller deals, but, you know, I wanted to build a company, right? And, and a company kind of almost like your company, where you, your company owns the assets, your company owns an investor database, your company owns a you know, property management company. So you could almost have like a, a multifaceted real estate investment firm mm -hmm. uh, with multiple arms and that uh, in, you know, attracted me. It's a much more scalable business model versus just to have you know, 30, 40 single family homes. Josh, I pulled the Jake right there. I jumped right into the podcast without asking Ryan about his background, about why multifamily. So please excuse me. But Ryan, just tell the listeners why you select multifamily because you've got a great career. You're a high level income earner. Your wife is probably smarter than you are. Probably I should say that because Definitely. she's <laughs> she is the doctor. So tell us why multifamily? What attracted you to this space? You know, ultimately, I, I was looking to to pivot out of healthcare, and that that's one of my big whys is to pivot out of healthcare. I'm I'm in that process now, and uh, you know, just in general, you know, I, I like working with partners. I like managing projects. I I like working uh to try to improve business systems, and you know, there's some of that in healthcare, but not uh, not a lot of that at my level. What I was doing. And, you know, I just, um, you know, just real estate in general, you know, a lot of it's to me, it's a much more straightforward pathway to build wealth in real estate. And, you know, I'm I'm shooting for to take advantages of like the tax advantages of real estate, especially. So my wife would be the earned income person and I will be, you know, the asset accumulator and, you know, tax deduction person. And what did your wife say when you told her, I really want to get into real estate full time? Uh, I mean, she's supportive. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there, there are some questions there when, when you're going to plan, okay, I'm going to take a major salary hit and this is my plan. But, you know, she ultimately, she trusts me. So she's, she's very supportive. What about the people in your inner circle, friends, family members, coworkers? What was their initial reaction? You know, I, I still get a lot of people like, oh, you're crazy. You're like, why? Like, what? You have such a great gig. You know, you work so hard to do it. And, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of feel like, hey, that's just, that's just what I want to do. And, and it's a very great story starter. You know, if, if I could, if I'm in the operating room and I'm saying, and I pretty much lead with real estate, you know, in, in the operating room, I'm, I'm talking about uh, doing deals in the hospital all, all the time. And people, it's very intriguing to people like, okay, like you're putting these people to sleep, but you're trying to not do that anymore. And you're trying to buy apartment buildings. Like, tell me more. Um, so, so tell me more about that. I mean, tell me really, let's get down to the crux of why 
you want to get into healthcare and get into multifamily? Like what, what's the big why? You said why, but what is your big why? Yeah. So, you know, I've been doing healthcare now or in, in the anesthesia space. I put people to sleep for surgery. I've been doing that for uh, 14 years now uh, with a license. And then I trained for three years to do that. So 17 years total in the anesthesia space, 21 years total in the healthcare space. And about you know eight years into my current career, I realized just something wasn't right. Uh, I felt like maybe there was a little bit of lack of growth. I was going to be able to achieve income growth, but that is was going to be, you know, require me trading more time for money in the hospital, working more call shifts, overnight shifts, weekend shifts, and to me that the trade off wasn't wasn't that great. You know, I was like, yeah, I can make the money, but I, I'm sacrificing all of my time, and then I don't really even own the business, right? I'm making, I'm I'm working for someone else's business, and I'm getting paid a, a, a very nice salary. But ultimately, I don't, I don't want to work for someone. I want to work for myself, and I want people to work for me, um, and. You know, another thing too with the healthcare is, you know, we actually have like a almost like a pandemic with inside of a pandemic, right? Healthcare workers are burnt out, especially, especially during COVID, but even before COVID, you know, it's a, uh, and I was telling, uh, who's a Brian Briscoe recently on a podcast, there, there's a lot of correlations between like healthcare and the battlefield, right? You have injuries, you have people's lives that are at risk, you have to make uh, split second decisions, and it's life or death type decisions. And, you know, ultimately, if you if you have 17 years of that day in and day out and day in and day out, you know, it can, uh, it can have an effect on you. And I, and I kind of just owned it. And I was like, okay, I'm burned out from this. And I realized, uh, you know, I had a decision to make, I could either just suck it up and just keep, you know, dreading it and just kind of slogging through it for the next 30 years, or I could pivot and, and try to get out and that I chose the latter. So Ryan, we just did a podcast recording with Stephen Pressfield, the second one. It's on the Jake and Gino show. And uh, I asked Stephen Pressfield the resistance. You must have felt that resistance of going into that next career. And Stephen says he thinks that everyone has that urge or that feeling. We just don't want to discuss it. And for you, it seems as if the resistance or the, the dream that you were looking for is owning your own business. Is that accurate to say? Because a lot of us out there have a dream, whether we become, want to become an artist, whether we want to create our own business. And from you, it's it seems as if multifamily is the perfect fit because you have a great investment vehicle. You can shelter a lot of income. You can grow and buy assets and create, you know, generational wealth, legacy wealth, others. But then ultimately, that's not the only thing. You're trying to really control your own future and you're trying to control your pay and you're trying to create this amazing business. Is that what I guess multifamily ultimately is is for you? No, I mean exactly, a hundred percent. I mean, just multifamily, but then just real estate in general. You know, you don't have you can you can say multifamily. You can say there's people that do the same thing with hotels. You know, and it's a mm -hmm. you you know you want to I want a business where you know I have people that work for me. I have systems in place. Um, you know, almost like you, I'm, I'm trying to, you're, you're, you're a mentor of me. And I, I look at the, the things that you've built and, you know, I, I'm like, oh, wow, you know, I get it. That, that is a uh, reachable for me. So for everyone out there who's listening to this, I challenge you, if you're stuck, like Ryan was, if you're stuck, like I was, if you're stuck, like Josh was just be honest with yourself, ask yourself the question or listen to the question I'm about to pose. If there's something you could do in life right now that you're not doing, what would that be? And for me right now, personally, it, it's singing opera. I don't know why. I just like to sing opera and I'm doing it every week. And it's something that I never thought I had resistance towards it. And if that answer brings up a lot of resistance, maybe there's some something that you need to reevaluate in your life and put some more effort towards it. And we're all going to face resistance. And l listen, I, I want to, my next question may be a, a challenging one to Ryan, but your identity, Ryan, is a doctor and an anesthesiologist. You're accomplished. You've been doing it for a while. How does the identity shift for you now? talking about multifamily and real estate and where people are like, yeah, but you're not, you're not real estate. You're a doctor. I mean, how, how are you overcoming that belief? Cause a lot of us have those living beliefs that I did when I was in the restaurant, I was the pizza guy who's going to talk to me about multifamily when all they know is me slinging pizzas. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of been going that, you know, so I've been doing real estate, I guess, investing since 2018 with rentals and flips and new construction flips and now building these smaller deals and, you know, I was just talking about it a lot and all kind of talking about it just to just to share what I was doing because it was it was so fun. I, I was very passionate about it. And I would be talking like, say, in the lunchroom or in the cafeteria, just saying, oh, look at this rental I bought. This is my business plan. And they'll be like, man, you seem really passionate about this. So I think just mm -hmm. sharing what you're doing and documenting what you're doing, that definitely helped uh, not only change my identity in the view of others, but change the identity for myself. I, I kind of no longer think that 
uh, I'm the anesthesia person. I'm like the real estate investor that also does anesthesia versus, versus when you start out, I was like the anesthesia person that does real estate on the side. Yes. I love that. Can you give us any tips for doctors or high income earners out there listening? How can they get into investing in real estate? Cause I know they can get investing with investing with you limited as a limited partner and then build that scale up. What avenues do you see them getting uh, into the real estate space? You know, I mean, professions kind of tend to pigeonhole themselves. Like, you know, you, for instance, doctors, like we'll all, their, their network will only be doctors, right? Mm -hmm. Or lawyers, they'll only hang around with lawyers. So I say kind of get out of your comfort zone, hang around different people. And when, once you start hanging around, say different individuals, like entrepreneurs, like business owners, real estate investors, you almost kind of just get a different worldview of, you know, money, of time, of just of really drive. You know, I mean, you think there's a lot of, you know, physicians and just healthcare workers in general are some of some of the more ambitious people that I know. But then when you when you get in the room of this, you know, 600 real estate investors, and everyone's trying to either build generational wealth or multi million dollar portfolios, you're like, wow, okay, these people are like almost driven on another level. So you know, definitely get get out of your own little space. And you know, don't be afraid to get get around people where maybe you're not the expert, you're not the content expert, you know, in anesthesia, I might have been the expert. But when, once I'm new into real estate, going to these conferences, I'm not the expert, but just learn from people that, you know, are, are much more accomplished than you are. Isn't that difficult, Ryan, for a lot of high income earners, especially doctors, not to be the expert? What would your advice be on that? Because sometimes we need to take a step back. I was in the restaurant business for over 20 years. I was pretty good at it. I Once I started learning new other stuff, the ego takes a little bit of a hit. Do you have any advice on that as far as, hey, going back and becoming a learner, becoming a lifelong learner and asking those difficult questions. Yeah, I mean, definitely be a lifelong learner, but not just within your narrow field, be a, a lifelong learner just in general. And, you know, you, you're, you, want, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You know, maybe maybe as, if you're a surgeon, you're going to be the, the top surgeon at spine surgery, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be, you know, the top real estate investor of somebody that does this full time and you know, earns all their income from this. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, surround yourself by people that have expertise that you don't have mm -hmm. and just add value to them and let them add value to you and, you know, things, good things are going to happen if you kind of be a go-giver versus a taker. Mm -hmm. What problems were, ex were you experiencing before joining Jake and Gino? Oh, and I, uh, you know, I didn't really have much direction, honestly. Um, you know, I, I was investing in deals. I did have one partner that I was doing deals with, and I still do, you know, smaller deals with him today. But, you know, I just didn't, uh, just my mindset really opened up. When you, when you meet other people that are doing it, you, you're around just people that are way ahead of you or at your level or just a, a few steps above your level and just getting the mentorship from not only the coaches, but just the other students to just to share their successes and hardships and whatnot. I mean, it's definitely, uh, it, it accelerates your growth exponentially. And what was the difference once you joined the community? Uh, did that frustration go away? Did you see other avenues? Did you get the focus come into play as well? I mean, definitely the focus, you know, for, for the first six months, I kind of drank out of the fire hose and, you know, you're, you're assuming all, you know, consuming all the content and the, the education and the conferences and the networking. And then probably six months in, I shifted and I started to get like a little bit more focused and say, okay, like, I think I'm going to be good at this. I need to partner with other people that are good at this. And that's mm -hmm. kind of a, that's kind of how I've been operating. Just like try to surround myself with uh, capable who's that fill my deficiencies and I fill their deficiencies. This may be hard to answer, but do you think you'd be where you are right now if you didn't join a mentorship program or if you didn't have that focus? Would you still be doing those small deals? Would you have not found those partners? What would it look like today if you if you weren't down that path? No, I mean, I think in joining a program like this, definitely like it's like throws gas on the fire, right? Not only, uh, you know, you already have the fire and maybe it's a, just a match lit, but then when you when you add the education with the networking, you just and just being around everyone that that's doing things, it's it's just it just kind of opens up your mindset, and really that's what it takes. It's it's a mindset shift, right? I mean, you could do it without without mentorship and education, but once you have in there, once you're in there and someone's coaching you up and you're around everyone else that's doing it, it, it just it opens up your your vision for sure. Let's talk about that deal you were, we were discussing in Austin. How did you find the deal? How did you put the deal together? And you know what what is your criteria, your buy right criteria? What are you focused on right now for your business? So yeah, so th this deal was it was a 138 unit deal in Austin, just north of downtown. You know, I, I wasn't the deal finder in, in this opportunity. Uh, an individual that I met in Houston uh, with with a track record, uh, he had the deal and. Probably like six months into the program, I, I I'm vetting all like I'm vetting operators like within the within the community, but I'm also vetting local operators because you know most of my investor database 
are Texas individuals. So if you're, you know, if you have money to invest and you live in Texas, there's a lot of Texas pride. So people are going to want to invest in Texas. And mm-hmm. so I started vetting operators out and just saying, Hey, like, you know, this is what I think I could bring to your team. Uh, I would love to work with you. And, you know, I, I reached out to him probably eight months before we got this deal and, you know, just kind of talked to him, developed a relationship. And then once he got the deal under contract or he was negotiating the contract, he was like, Oh, I think this would be a perfect deal for your first deal. Um, so I, I jumped on with him and I came on as more of like a, I guess, a marketing person and a capital raiser uh, up front in, in the early process. And what did you like about the deal? Yes. I mean, the lo- definitely location, location, location for this one. I mean, it's like four or five minutes north of downtown. It's a booming sub market. I mean, there's like the largest uh, public private partnership between the city of Austin and a major developer is happening at the site of the old airport there at the Mueller airport. So, I mean, just Austin in general is booming, but this little sub market is just booming. There's a 300 unit class A deal that's being built right across the street. Uh, so we just saw a lot of upside, a lot of demographic shift in this little sub market within the next five to 10 years, for sure. And you you made an interesting little discussion right there where you were talking about, let me vet sponsors. Really, really important. How do you vet sponsors? Well, first you have to know them, right? So it's, I, I kind of use the know, like, and trust thing. So first you have to know them. So I, I, I just called people up or just connected with them on social media and, you know, got, got to know them first, broke the ice. And, you know, as we kind of kept the discussions going, um, you know, that I, you know, I offered to take this, this guy to, to lunch and, you know, we, we did lunch, we did dinner. I met another partner and then we're like, okay, I, I like this guy. And then, so let, let's, let's start looking at some deals together. And like, uh, we just kind of went from there. I mean, I, I just really put myself out there and said, okay, like, I think deep down inside everyone that's entering this space knows maybe a characteristic that they could bring to an existing team. Cause I, I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you're a financial guy and you're really good at underwriting, or maybe you're, you're already a broker. So you you can get the broker relations. For me, I thought, okay, I have a network of accredited investors that I think that would like to invest in these opportunities. So I kind of led with that. And as far as raising capital, Ryan, were you comfortable raising capital? I mean, would you, what tips would you give to anyone starting out in multifamily on, on raising capital? You know, it, it was my first, it was my first time raising capital. And I, I, I say, if you're going to, Commit to uh, say working with someone else. I say under promise and try to over deliver. Obviously, don't go in there and it's your first time saying, "Oh, I can raise two million dollars for you." Because who knows if if you can, great, you're going to be a rock star. But if you you know what, you wouldn't want to tell someone that and they have that in, factored into their business plan and you strike out and you don't raise any money, then that's going to probably hurt the team overall. Uh, and I and I say just really put yourself out there. And I, I know a lot of uh, a lot of people thought you know focus on the thought leadership program or thought leadership platform and the podcast and whatnot. And I think all those are extremely important. But I think what's often overlooked is to to I like to get real real specific early and then cast a wide net. So you need to be hitting all your network all your, like, how many people do you have on your phone? If you're 40 years old, like myself, I'm sure you probably have 2000 contacts on your phone. How many people are you connected with on Facebook? I'm sure you probably connected with 2000 people on Facebook. That's the first 4,000 people you reach out to, right? To start building your investor database versus starting a podcast. That's great, but that's going to throw a wide net. I say throw a, a small, narrow net first and capture your existing network first and then start from with the wider network. I love that. Do you mind if I add a couple of things to that as well? Yeah. Well, just listening from your story, I think the very first thing you need to do is you really need to educate yourself. You need to educate yourself on the space. You need to educate yourself on the sponsorships, the sponsors who are, you're going to be working with, or if you're doing deals by yourself, being able to have the market selected, being able to have a buy rate criteria and having your business plan. That's really first and foremost, really important. And, and Ryan was, has been discussing that throughout the podcast, but I want to make that really, really clear. Have your vision of what you're trying to accomplish. So you'd be able to talk to potential investors. The second thing, which you've mentioned before was be really passionate about what you're doing. I mean, like once you're passionate about it, you can overcome your identity or your lack of credibility by really showing the people you're speaking to that. I love this asset, being able to describe it in easy and simple terms. You don't have to go into pref rates on the first time. You don't have to go into waterfalls or IRRs. You just talk about the asset itself and what it's allowed you to do. I think the next thing is you, you said it also in the show, create your story. You've got a great story. You've been in healthcare for 13 plus years doing it total of 20 years. 
And then now all of a sudden I'm doing real estate. And that's a great way to start talking to people about raising capital, your personal story, because ultimately people want to invest in you, not just in your own deals, but they want to know that Ryan's going to be able to perform. They want to know that Ryan's going to be transparent. They want to know that Ryan's going to be honest with them. And that's a great, I love the idea of not going out, being a thought leader in the very beginning, but really getting intimate with your friends and family and the people that you know, you'd be very surprised how many people that are, you have come in contact contact with over the last 10 or 15 years that is that is in your Rolodex as we like to say the old timers they're they're in there and I think that's really important so being passionate about it and then ultimately like you said just bringing value and and letting them know that this is an asset class that's going to be an amazing asset class for the foreseeable future there's a lot of demand for it and it's something that's a physical hard asset we can go into the inflation you know uh, we you can overcome inflation is so many different assets. But what's really important is letting them know you personally, letting them know that you're the one who's going to be handling this investment and being really educated and being transparent. I think that's, that's truly important. I, I love the answer you gave. Last question before we go to the, go to the short answer is where do you see yourself going in the next three to five years with multifamily? Yeah, so we haven't really released the email yet. But I'm guessing this, this email that this podcast is going to you know, broadcast weeks out. So I'm going to go ahead and say it now. So I have two of the partners from our Austin deal. We've, we've gone ahead and we've joined forces and I'm going to be coming in under uh, the, the more experienced individuals brand. It's going to be under the Gen Wealth Capital brand. Uh, this individual has, you know, about 1400 doors uh, to his name as a, a general partner and lead sponsor. So I'm going to be uh, jumping on with him. And so we're all going to be, it's three of us. And, you know, we all, we've worked together for the last, last nine months and we realized, Hey, like we all have different strengths and different weaknesses. And this actually fits well together, like as a team. So, you know, we're definitely going to be very active in the market. We have like maybe three LOIs out between Houston and Austin right now. We, we have the deal board is very hot and, you know, we're systematizing everything. And for me, um, you know, as they're going to be handling more of an acquisitions, but, you know, if you're starting a syndication business, you need two components, you need deal flow and you need investor flow. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my primary role in this company is just to going to be to give the company investor flow. Right. So I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere, just constantly list building. So let me ask you another question before you go to your answer. I can keep asking questions here, but <laughs> the, as far as timeline for, for leaving your, your W2 job, do you see that in the next three to five years? I'm actually going 50% in April. So I'm wow. going to go ahead and make the jump. Uh, I'm going to go 50% in April. Uh, that, that'll, that'll require me to work two days a week at the hospital. And I'll have, you know, really three days off during the week to, to really focus. Cause I have been doing this, you know, full-time at the hospital and seems like almost full-time hours uh, to start out, you know, so I'm kind of doing double, double the work. And so it'll be nice to just have some time to really think. So this is important, everybody. This is probably one of the biggest golden nuggets that you're going to get from the show. You don't have to burn the ships. You can take a methodical approach. I did the same thing back in October of 2015. I left the restaurant during the week. I only worked on the weekends and I did real estate full time. So being methodical, being thoughtful, putting in a plan and executing the plan is really important. Proper planning prevents poor performance. You don't have to go out there and quit your job tomorrow and go into multifamily full time or go into single family full time. You can be methodical. And I, I love that approach because what happens is he's still earning income. He's still got a W-2 job. He's still got some money coming in. And then from there, it's great. But then he's got plenty of time to work on his other side hustle. And maybe for the next six months, Ryan, you're going to be working 65, 70 hours a week. You're going to be in the grind. You're going to love it. But then by the end of this year, you'll see where you are. You'll probably have another two, deal or two on the contract. You've made some act fees. You've got more investors. And all of a sudden you're saying, okay, now it's time. So please, everybody, that's a great, great story of being methodical and not having to burn those ships you can burn them in your mind and saying hey i'm going to be doing this but i don't have to do this tomorrow i can be methodical so um i love that i'm, I'm glad you shared that with us let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors gino i know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level i know that you've been hard at work helping jake and gino students do just that using our framework can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help guys we've been hard at work growing our community 
community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. All right, Ryan, I got some short answer questions here for you. So if you could go back to 2017 version of yourself and give yourself one piece of advice, knowing what you know now when you started investing, what would that be and why? Uh, you know, I would start, you know, if you're going to be like, for instance, if I'm going to be coming in as a capital raiser, like I was at the beginning, you, you start marketing early and you start, start shifting the mindset and start shifting the story early. And just, it's going to be the long game, right? If you're going to, if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to, it's 2022 now, but had I shifted the mindset in 2017, I would m maybe be much further along than I am now. Mm -hmm. And I think I've made a lot, a lot of strides in the last year, but I would say start shifting my personal mindset. Doesn't necessarily mean I have to join a community or anything like that, but just, just make the decision like, Hey, I, I'm, I'm not going to be a healthcare worker anymore. I'm going to be a real estate investor and just lead with it and just constantly be putting yourself out there. Cause the longer you have that identity shift, the longer you're doing it, the, the more people are going to recognize you as uh, the new you. And how do you, how do you do that though? Get that mind shift. How did you do that? I mean, eventually now, but back in 2017, if you had to give yourself advice on how am I shifting my mindset back then, how would you have done it? You know, I think just as you're learning and as you're say maybe doing small personal deals, I mean, you just have to constantly share. And I, I was just scared to share it initially. I would share with my close colleagues and my, you know, obviously my friends and family, but I, I want to say like the first time I ever put something on about real estate on social media was maybe like a year and a half ago or something, mm -hmm. just because, you know, I, I don't know if you, you have imposter syndrome. So just, just push through all that. Like no one really cares. Really it's only you that cares. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to just push through all that and just do it. I mean, it's not a, it's not that big of a deal. Ryan, I've been doing some research on NLP lately and NLP neuro linguistic programming. They say that we see the world as a map not as a whole terrain. So back in 2017, you may have been seeing real estate as just six single family homes or small development. Then when you join a community of like-minded individuals, all of a sudden you're seeing this person do a hundred units syndication, this person doing a 35 unit JV, all of a sudden your map is expanded. And that's why when you said earlier in the podcast, it was very important. Lawyers hang out with lawyers, birds of a feather flock together. If you're only hanging out with certain individuals and you're not seeing what's going on in the rest of, of business, you're going to have a smaller map, but that's why it's important for everybody to get out there and join these communities and start looking at what other people are doing. Cause all of a sudden your map starts expanding and when your map starts expanding, your mindset starts expanding. And when your mindset starts expanding, your beliefs start to expand because behaviors are belief driven. If I had told Ryan that he's been partnering up on 138 unit deal four years ago, he would have thought I was crazy because his map, his reality, people see the world as they are, not as it is, was of only doing smaller deals, single family homes, a couple of flips. But now four years later, he's been involved and surrounded by amazing people and partnerships. Now his map's expanded. Now he's got three LOIs out on deals. And it's really amazing what's happened. So I think that's, that's truly important. Trying to expand the map and the way you do that with the mindset is by getting around other people and expanding the knowledge. And not only just the knowledge, the belief that you can do that. And like you've talked about with the identity and all that, but getting around other people who you want to, I guess, emulate as far as their success goes. Sure. Yeah. Success, success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. Love it. Ryan, all right, you're someone who's created a lot of success in different industries, you know, in your career. Now, obviously, real estate investing. What's been a habit that's attributed or contributed to that level of success? I mean, you, you just have to do the work. I mean, it's not it's not always going to be fun. Like, I mean, when I first started doing the underwriting, like I, I didn't like it. I'm not going to lie. I was just <laughs> like, OK, uh, uh, you know, I'm not an Excel guy. Like, how does this work again? But you really just have to put the reps in and get more comfortable. And it's just like, you know, it's just like working out, you know, you haven't worked out in three years, you start going to the gym and you're miserable and it hurts and you don't really like to be there. But, you know, week three, week four, week eight, it all starts to get easier. And as you kind of just kind of keep stacking it and you have to make it a habit, right? So uh, you make underwriting a habit or you make uh, building your investor database a habit. And it's like, okay, this has to get done today. You have to have, you know, small achievable goals that you're just constantly building on top of each other. Love it. The compound effect. Okay. Last question, favorite book and why? Uh, I would definitely say, uh, you know, who, not how, I think his name is, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a Dan Sullivan or no, who is it? Mm -hmm. um, Benjamin yeah. Hardy. 
Else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a, uh, I mean, that, that's a great book. I mean, I, I read that book maybe eight or nine months ago and then I kind of just completely changed my perspective of like, okay, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to do everything. And I don't have to be the, the jack of all trades. I don't have to be the master of all this. I, I just need to find who's like, who, who can help me with this, who can help me with that. And then how can I help you? This is what I have. How can I help you? So I'm just constantly looking for who's for me or looking to be somebody's who really because the uh, partnership partnerships are key i think in this industry so whether it's like permanent partners like i just like i just developed a permanent partnership or just one-off partners or just partners that can help you with an aspect of the business that that you need i mean you just constantly have to have like your radar out just seeing you know who you can bring on board and you know who you can jump on board with man i love that all right this has been a pretty impactful episode gino give us some of the golden nuggets you're able to fish out well, the importance of joining a community, we were on Toastmasters one night, Ryan, and he mentioned the who, not how. So I went down that rabbit hole and then I had to read the gap in the gain. And it's really amazing when you surround yourself with like-minded individuals, you learn from them. And if he'd never mentioned that book to me, I wouldn't have been able to do a presentation at the Bayer Boot Camp we did in Phoenix. Because I think the gap in the gain is probably just as good as who, not how, maybe even better because the gap talks about, oh, being negative and looking at other people. Like, like Ryan said on the podcast, if you go back and listen to the show, there's so many words of wisdom that he's spoken about. We could go on and on and really discuss them all. But this one, when he says, people don't really care you, when you're looking in the gap, you're worried about what other people think about right now, Ryan's living in the game. He's looking in the future. He's already planning that in April, he's going two days. And the amazing thing is when you're in the game, also look at all of the success that he's had in the last year. He joined 12 months ago. And within those 12 months, he's gotten the focus. He, he set up a plan that he's ready to exit his W2 part-time. He's created a partnership. And more importantly, he's learned the skills and that the who of what he's going to bring to the table and who he needs to incorporate in his business. So it's been an amazing ride for the last 12 months to see him come on looking at these smaller deals and all of a sudden being focused in and knowing that he wants to create this multifaceted multifamily where he has a syndication company, he has a property management company. I, he even has a small development company going on and really being versatile and building out that vertical integration. So for everybody out there wanting to get into multifamily, focus on what you want to achieve in this business, focus on where your areas of strength are. And when you partner up, who can you partner up with? If you're the, if you're the person that doesn't know how to do something, partner up with somebody that does, but also know what your true value is. For sure. That's great. Man. Yeah, I love that. Ryan, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Yeah, I know. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm all over social media, definitely Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. My email is uh, ryan at genwealthcapital.com. So feel free to, to send me an email and I'd love to you know set up a call and talk. I oh, love it. Well, listen, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing your movers and shakers story. Guys, listen, if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, guys.